All right, guys, what's going on? In today's video, I wanna talk a little bit about selling your gem. So this is a conversation, or I guess a question that has come up a lot, um, and it's also a process I've uh, participated in myself a couple times over the years of owning my gyms over the course of a decade, and also in the course of working with a thousand plus gyms here at Big Little Gyms. It's something I've uh, had a, a strong part to play in the acquisition of many other gyms um, as we've had gym owners come on our program, implement systems, build a really good scalable gym, and then get interest in someone wanting to acquire it from them. Uh, and it's also just something we get a lot of questions on because a lot of gym owners uh, eventually build the business to a place where either they you know, want to move on from it, they've got a great offer, and uh, they're ready to go on to another phase of their life, or you know, it's part of a process of owning, building, and uh, selling, seeking acquisition on multiple gyms in succession. That's really, really common. Um, also, it's something that at some point, if you build the business really successfully, you're probably gonna wanna participate in because when you, when you build a business, there's only, there's only three ways that you, you exit a business. Um, and there's no magical fourth way. It's, it's one of these three things that are gonna happen to you when you own a business. Either uh, number one, you're gonna do what we're talking about here and you're gonna sell it. You're gonna get it acquired. Someone else is gonna to wanna to buy it because they see it as valuable and they see it as worth paying a premium or some sort of multiple of profits to you to take it from you and, and go and grow it to the next level. That's number one. Uh, number two would be that they uh, that you, you, you die owning it, right? This is, sec I would call this second place. This is the second best situation. Um, I also, you know, and, and it's kind of up to you if you're building like a family business that you want to hand down generationally, then that's okay. I would still say this video is valuable for you if that's the situation you're looking at, because everything I'm going to share with you here, like building a gym or building a business to sell, uh, is what also builds the most profitable business and the most st stress-free business to run. Every, so everything we're talking about here, even though it's, we're talking about building a business to sell, um, we're really talking about how to build a really successful, profitable business because ultimately the business that's going to sell and get you the best offer is the one that is going to have the most cash flow. It's going to be operationally most efficient and it's going to be great at, get, great at acquiring and getting new customers. So all these things are super important, whether or not you're even trying to sell your gym at all. Um, I think this is just good information for a gym owner to start with. Um, and, I'll, and I'm going to, and this is going to be in today's video, like I'm going to tell you my story and how I got there. And then there's, you know, and talking about the three ways you can exit a gym, the third way, just to kind of close that loop, you know, number one being you have to sell it and get, a, get it acquired by somebody else that wants to take it. Uh, number two being that you die owning it, right? That's how you're going out of business. Even though like the business stays in business, you are no longer in business because you're dead, right? Um, the third route would be to go out of business, right? To go bankrupt. And the third one, unfortunately, is actually the most common by far. Like 90, I think it's like 97% of businesses will uh, resort to that third option of going out of business um, outside of your own control, right? Uh, which you can argue what that means, or we can debate what that means, how much control, how little control people take over their own ownership of their own responsibilities and things like that. Um, so we're gonna get into that today, guys. I'm gonna go over this selling a gym, which is you know one part story uh, and one part, one part guide. And uh, we're gonna get into this, okay? Now, before I do, uh, you know, just like I do in every video, if you find this video valuable, if you get some gold nuggets out of it, um, if, you, if you enjoy it, if this helps you make better decisions with your business, you know, uh, the only thing I ask for in return for sitting here and doing this for you guys, taking the, the hours, uh, it took me two hours just to, to create the slides you're going to look at here just to record this and then the time plus the time recording. And so I ask people, the only thing I ask you to do is just leave a like, uh, even better comment. If you found it valuable, let me know it was valuable. That's very motivating for me. It lets me know that you found it valuable. Um, it also motivates me to want to do more of it. Um, it also is really good for the YouTube algorithm, right? I want more people to see this ultimately at the end of the day. You know, my company, Big Little Gyms, we help a lot of gyms do exactly what we're going to talk about in this video. It's how we make our money. And we believe in win-win scenarios with the customers that uh, come to us. So if this helps us get in front of more gyms that need our help and our services, uh, then that's a good thing, right? So we, we get the help of the YouTube algorithm when you guys like, subscribe, click the notification bell and leave comments on these videos. So we greatly appreciate if you guys did that. So with that, let's move into the, today's video. Um, so selling a gym, one part story and one part guide. So I'm going to tell you guys what I did, you know, what happened with me in my journey, because everybody's journey is unique. And also, you know, I want to let you know right up front that this is a very transparent v video and that like 
this isn't how to get a business acquired by the book, right? There's, there's the way they say you should do it. And there's the way it's probably in the way it went for me and the way that it's probably going to go for you is going to be a little bit different. So I want to share my individual experience so I can share you with you what to look out for, because you can read books on this stuff. And, um, it is often, uh, you know, they make it sound so easy. And, uh, then you go through the process and realize, oh, wow, it's actually, you know, a unique experience for everybody. So I'm going to share that. I'm going to share you my advice, um, for if you're looking to sell, and I'm going to share what to look out for. Okay. So, um, I'm definitely going to share some of like the, the book read stuff I've read over the years too, as well for you resources that you can go and read, uh, separate from this video. Cause you might watch this video, however long it takes an hour and be like, man, I want to read more on this. Okay. Uh, and of course, like in our program here at big little gyms, like we talk about this stuff all the time, our, our community and our tribe, our, our entire forum, where all of our gym owners communi communicate with, there's a wealth of information regarding selling your gym, our weekly coaching calls. We talk about this stuff all the time. So of course there's that available to you, but if you want to read some things, you know, outside of my circles here, I'll give you some resources that you can go and read yourself, um, that were helpful for me along the way. But again, the book read versions aren't always the way it goes. So it's very important to share the anecdotal stuff as well. So we're going to go over uh, the phases of selling a gym. Uh, you got your, my past experience here that's unique to me, which I'll share with you, which I think is honestly very relatable to how it's going to go down for most gym owners watching this. Because uh, while my experience was unique in regards to selling a business, I don't think it's that unique in regards to selling a gym specifically, especially a brick and mortar independently owned group fitness studio. Um, which if you're watching this, that's probably what you own. Um, you might own a big box style gym. You might own a slightly different style of gym, but it, I'm, I'm going to say it's pretty similar. Okay. So we're going to talk about building it, you know, how you should build it along the way, because you have to build the business to sell. If you, um, you always want to start a business with the end in mind, right? Because again, there's only three ways you go out of business and ideally you set yourself up for the one that is most advantageous for you and your family. So you have to build it to sell, right? So we're going to talk about building it. How do you build it to sell? We're going to talk about making it sellable. We're going to talk about starting the process to sell. We're going to talk about getting offers and then exiting the gym as well. And of course, like at the end of this video, because this is something, you know, there's people that spend their entire lives building books around this thing. So to try to cover every single angle of it in, uh, you know, however long this takes, 45 minute, one hour, hour and a half long video is just, there's going to be something that's missed. So I encourage you guys to use the comment section. Um, so we can close the loops on some of those questions you might have or something that maybe I don't close the loop on this video. Um, you know, I'm always working on being better at that, but sometimes I'll start talking about something and then go deep into that rabbit hole and then forget to come back and close the loop on something. So please use the comment section to let me know um, if there's anything I need to close the loop on there. Okay, so let's talk about step one here, my past experience, guys. So I was the owner of two different gyms before. Um, over the course of a decade, I started the first gym in like late 2011. It was mid late 2011. There's kind of a gray area. If you want to say starting it, it was over the course of the year of, um, amassing the equipment, kind of how it came together was really, really interesting. And I'll tell the story really quickly. And that's that I owned a much bigger business prior to this. Um, I had moved, I had, I'd started a company out of my garage back when I was like 24 years old. Um, and it was a landscape installation company. We used to install artificial grass products. And we were one of the first companies here in the Phoenix Valley to do that. And uh, because we were kind of early on this new product that everybody was installing in their uh, like zero escape desert backyards here, um, it, it became a very popular product and our company grew with it. Plus I was out there really hustling at this business. It, I was 24 years old. So I would, you know, I would install a job and knock doors in the entire neighborhood, you know, and uh, I was, you know, if someone of a lead came in, I was also like, early in learning like digital marketing with like Google um, and running ads on Google since 2006, 2007. And I built that. So those two skills of like, you know, knowing how to install a really, really good in demand product and also how to market it um, with what was, you know, what I ended up being early on with like Google back then it was like, I was getting leads for five cents a piece and just learning the nuances of that as it became more competitive. Um, I was able to build that business to $5 million a year. And when I did that, I ended up taking the business multiple states because I was importing a lot of product to uh, the Southern California port ports. The Long Beach port ashes were a bunch of product that I was shipping in from different parts of the world that were uh, different parts of like the process of installing an artificial gra grass lawn for someone's house. Rather than buy through middlemen here in the States, we would import the product ourselves and wholesale it ourselves. So naturally we would, we would uh, need a warehouse there on the coast because we were paying a lot of um, logistics costs to warehouse product before it came over here to Phoenix. So I decided to open up a Southern California branch. And when I went to Southern California, I was in a phase of life where like I was, you know, working very hard on my business, but wasn't really focused on taking care of myself. 
Um, so I decided to get back into fitness as part of living by the beach, as part of, um, you know, this new phase of life of like living on the California coast, which was a dream of mine. So when I was there, I walked into a CrossFit gym. This was 2010, um, and had this amazing experience that we had CrossFit games athletes in this gym. It was CrossFit was this kind of like, it, it was like an early adopter scene in 2010. Um, and it wasn't yet mainstream and it was kind of like you found fight club and it was really, really cool. And it was like guys working out in Chuck Taylor's and board shorts. You didn't have to worry about taking your shirts off. Like no one had problems with that. It was kind of almost encouraged. Like, Hey, if you're hot, take your shirt off. We don't care if you sweat on the floor. And it was the same with the girls. Everybody was, you know, having a good time. It was, um, a really, really enjoyable experience. And, um, within like a year or so I could see the trend of like these gyms growing, that, that this was going to be like a very popular thing in the coming years. Um, and it already kind of already was at that point. It was already, it was kind of going from early adopters to mainstream at that point. It was getting some buzz, but it wasn't yet blown up yet. So I decided to open one of these gyms in the part of town that I lived in or had moved to because I was, uh, had bought, went to this initial gym when I lived in Newport beach, California. When we were there in California, the business kept growing. So we ended up buying a house there in Huntington beach. And then our warehouse was in a city called Fullerton and, uh, there in Fullerton where we had this warehouse, there was not, there was not a CrossFit gym. There was, there weren't any. So we decided to open up the first one in that area within like a five, six mile radius. And we did it because, um, I had the extra warehouse space there. In fact, I'm going to rewind a step and tell you, uh, a really interesting part of how this came together. And that was that when I was importing all this product from China, we would have these 40 foot container ships. That's kind of the standard length for a container ship. And inside that container ship would be, uh, these rolls of artificial grass, but we couldn't fit, uh, we can only fit two rows, two stacks of artificial grass, but in the end of every container was like a 10 feet of empty space. So I used to use that empty space to bring in products that I would sell on e-commerce. I would, I also ran an, e, uh, an Amazon store where we sold almost anything I can buy cheap and sell high. I would just basically reverse engineer what things were selling for on Amazon and then go do a search, uh, from the providers in China, which I knew how to do because I learned how to do participate in this kind of trade. And I would just find products that were vastly underpriced to buy at, at the price that they were selling for. I'd be like all kinds of different things, computer peripher peripherals, clothing, um, software, things like that, anything I could buy cheap and sell high. Uh, but I also brought in some fitness equipment. I actually brought in enough fitness equipment to start a fitness equipment company because I saw the growth trend of CrossFit. And I knew that these these gyms that were opening up, were going to need more com equipment at more competitive prices because at the time, all there really was, was rogue fitness, which was kind of expensive for like someone just starting up out of like their garage. So I was like, what if I could bring in some lower cost goods from China that like were good quality and I, I, I wanted needed, but I needed to bring some of the product in to test it out. So I actually brought in like a dozen barbells because there was minimum order quantity. So I had to buy like a dozen barbells, I had to buy like a dozen of everything, right? Enough, uh, to like test the goods. Right. And so I did that. Um, and, uh, and the shipping was already paid for. So that was most of the cost of bringing those goods in. So I had in the corner of this, of this warehouse that was for my artificial grass company and my e-com company, I had all this, uh, all this equipment that I was going to go retail. And I, I actually started a company called bear flag, bear flag fitness equipment company. And we had a website for it and it just never really took off like that kind of business. Like I needed to go market to the gyms and I just didn't have the time to go start like a whole third business. Cause I was already running this e-com company and the, the landscaping company, and they were already a lot of my work and I had a team I was managing. So to go do this third thing where I was going to have to go market it to the gyms. Cause I, you know, that's just the best way to market that kind of business is to like get to know the gym owners and like literally call them and let them know you have equipment. I just didn't have time to do that. So the equipment sat there for the better part of that year until my buddy moved West, who was also a CrossFitter. And he said, you know what, man, I'm thinking about moving out here to the coast. Why don't we partner up, put this equipment to use? He's like, I'll bring, uh, he's like, I'll do all the work you just contribute the equipment and we'll go 50, 50 on everything. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll do the market. And I, and my, my job was to do marketing and provide the equipment. His job was to do, um, the coaching running operational side of the business. So we did that and we, we built that business together. All right. Now just to kind of accelerate this video a little bit, because I want to make sure we get through everything today in a reasonable amount of time that gym, we ended up growing to 200 to 250 members at its peak. And, uh, it's, which is where I sold it was pretty much as peak. At its peak, I sold it to my partner, Eric, who ended up taking that business on and running it for a number of years afterwards with him and his, his wife, um, cause they wanted to make it their full-time gig and we were making good money from it. The business made about $14,000 a month in profit, uh, between the two of us, we were taking home about seven K when we would split that profit per month, um, which is like good money, but living in Southern California, like seven K a month, isn't really killing it. It's, it's okay. 
Um, and he was living very frugally, so he was doing okay. But he actually, he, he figured if he could buy me out, then, you know, he could um, take you know, that whole lump sum for himself, which I told him, you know, actually it works for me because I'm getting ready to move on from this first company, my turf company. I was getting ready to basically exit the whole thing, sell it and move on. And that meant also selling the gym in California. So luckily he wanted to do that just as that was coming together. So I said, go, let's go out, I'll sell it to you. And that's what we did. And we worked out the details on that. Um, and that, so it was kind of a passion project right here, you know, going to this slide here, a passion project. And uh, the second one was a built to sell gym. So the second gym was when I moved back to, to Arizona from California, I left with, you know, selling my, my bigger business. I left with selling that gym. I left with selling my house that I bought there. So I left with some cash. Okay. I left with a, a good situation. Now I wasn't that enlightened of a business owner back then. So almost, no, you know, almost none of those sales, uh, the house we did well on the bigger business, I definitely left a lot of opportunity on the table because I pretty much sold it for the equipment, what the equipment was worth, which was not, which I learned later is not the real value of a business. The real value of the business is the customer list and, and the actual revenue it generates, not the equipment and the bits and pieces. Right? So that was a big lesson learned for me. So when we went to go build the second gym in, in Arizona, I moved back and that was um, to build a gym to sell from, from the ground up, right? I want a business. It was on like my bucket list to build a business, my entrepreneurial bucket list, I call it, um, to build a business that uh, from the, the beginning was intention to sell and to be able to get a multiple and a good exit at the end because I kind of felt like I left a lot on the table with that bigger business in Southern California. So that's what I did. Uh, both gyms were ground up bootstrap brick and mortar locations, independently owned gyms. Uh, both were CrossFit affiliates. That's the only like brand affiliation we had, um, but they weren't like franchises. Uh, they were, they were, you know, we could do what we wanted. Um, I have built and sold other large, more enterprise type businesses, as I, as I mentioned, um, and learned a lot from those experiences, almost more what not to do uh, in selling my bigger businesses. You know, when you exit a $5 million a year company and, uh, you don't even get anywhere near that on the exit because you undervalued your exit. You didn't take it to market the right way and you didn't shop it and you didn't do the things I'm gonna share with you here. You learned really quickly what not to do, right? Even though like I still left in a great position and far, far wealthier than I was when I started those companies, which was dead broke. Um, and that's probably what it was, was like coming from being broke to being able to leave Southern California with you know several hundreds of thousands of dollars that I didn't have when I arrived there. Um, and go back to Arizona and buy some real estate and do some things like that, which is what I did next. And kind of a side project I still have to this day is I own some a small portfolio of rental properties here in Arizona that I bought back in 2013, 2014, when things were really, really cheap. They've done very, very well for me. You know, and, I, and all this started with nothing when I moved west back in 2005. You just poor kid moving west. So like when you have these big momentous things happen, like you're going to sell your gym, you get very blinded by the opportunity to walk away with some cash that you leave a lot on the table. Okay. So I want to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else. That's why I'm sharing this here. Okay. And what a lot of you are going to see in this video is from my own experience, uh, my mentors as well, because I've had many mentors and guides and have participated in many, many programs. I've spent probably to date near seven figures, a million dollars on uh, various coaching programs, mentorship, uh, systems and strategies from other people. Um, and it's been the most valuable money I've spent. Most best investments I've spent has been working with others to show me the path, right? Because at the end of the day, you're just a person walking the hero's journey and in the hero's journey in every great movie that's written that follows the hero's journey script, they always meet a mentor. And there's a reason why is because it's very relatable that like when you're standing right in front of the wall, all you can see is a brick. You need someone else that can step back and see the whole wall and say, Hey, listen, you got your eyes focused on the wrong brick. Right. Um, and, but I'm going to share with you some of the stuff to hopefully help save you some of this, some of the mistakes as well. Um, and this also video guys, this video is trying to collapse like 17 years of video ex of uh, business experience into like an hour. So things will get left out. Um, and then last year built profited and exited two gyms successfully. Uh, click correct my typo here, gym successfully in a 10 year window of time, guys. So just, so you know, the proof is in the pudding there to sell exit, to sell the, to have proof built profited and exited to gym successfully. Um, it's interesting, you know, um, I know I throw a lot of stones at other gurus on these videos, but that's because the reason why I started my company is because when I had my gyms, there are people out there trying to tell me how they are experts about growing gyms, but had never done any of it you know, how we run a big little gym series is a little bit different and that like everything we teach on has, has a wealth of experience behind it and that we've done it, we've walked the walk, right? So, you know, uh, it's important 
to be taking advice from people that have actually experienced it because uh, I hear other people in the space who have never done it talking about building, growing, and selling gyms. Maybe they've built a gym, but they've never sold one. They still own one. They've never actually exited one. You know what I mean? To be able to speak on what it's like, okay? So let's talk about building it up, guys. So just going, kind of following along, building it up, making it sellable, starting the process, getting offers and exiting it, uh, building it up, right? So again, I started with the end in mind. It's important that you do too. And maybe your gym's already in business and you're like, well, I already started. So how am I supposed to start with the end in mind? It's like, well, you could consider that maybe a restart, right? Like no one needs to know you're restarting, but it's because it's more internal. It's more mindset. It's more about how you choose to make decisions from this day going forward. Um, and for me, when I started my second gym, because the first one was more of a passion project, the second gym I had learned and said, I'm going to build it this way. Because the first one, I got a good exit from my partner buying me out. But, you know, like I wanted to do something no one else had done when they exited a gym with the second one, right? So I was aiming for a business I could own and not a self-employed situation. So this is very, very important. Most gym owners start their gym uh, simply because they need a job right? And they're thinking about what they could do for a living. And they're like, well, I can go get a job working for someone else. And in the world of being a trainer or a coach, there's not a lot of money in being a trainer for someone else, unless you work for like a handful of like very high profile studios that are in very marquee places where there's a high demand for that. Otherwise, you're going to probably work for like your local big box gym selling personal training and making like 30 bucks an hour training personal training sessions. So a lot of gym owners really are just trainers that don't want to do that. They want to make more money. In order to do that, they need to open up their own studio. The problem with that is, is that you're at the end of the day, like, sure, you're, you're a trainer, but you're now starting a business. And there's a big difference between a business owner and a self-employed person. And one of my favorite books to talk about with this is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the whole premise of the book is um, talking about the difference between, um, you know, someone who looks at their business or looks at their work as a way to just trade dollars for hours uh, versus the, the rich dad being someone that looks like they own, um, assets that multiply in value over time. Right. And they leverage other people doing the work for them. Right. In a positive way. Right. Like they leverage, they provide value to their employees by giving them good employment and consistent income in exchange for leveraging them, not having to be the ones to do all the physical labor, because at the end of the day, the lowest level of value, um, in regards to how our society looks at worth is the implementer right? Like we all need to eat food, but the people who prepare our food are the lowest paid people in the in our entire society, in all of our societies, no matter where you're at in the world. The burger flippers are the people that make the least amount of money. Most of the people crying about minimum wage are people that flip burgers, right? They, they do implementer level services. Um, and that's the lowest level of value. The second level, low, lowest, level, lowest value, lowest level of value. I'm going to write this down real quick here for you guys. So lowest level of value is implementer. Okay. And this is someone who uses their muscle. Okay. So it's the four, I call this the four M's. Okay. So we're going to go up here. Four M's. When you position yourself as an implementer in your, in any business, your business or someone else's, um, you are going to get paid the least that you, you could be paid in that business. Okay. Uh, the second level, the next level up, and just assign like a monetary value to this, like implementers usually are hovering around like minimum wage to like at most like 70K a year. If you're like, and that's even hard to find from an employer. Most employers making 70 are, are kind of participating in this next level, which is management. Okay. So the next M is, is management and uh, managers, you know, can make 50K a year to 250K a year on average on, as on the high side. Next level up is someone that uses their mouth, right? This is a communicator. And these are, uh, these are like salesmen, artists, um, let's see, salesmen, artists, speakers, personalities, influencers, you know, and this year, you know, on the low side, 80K a year. I don't know many salesmen that make less than that unless they just aren't good at it. Up to, I mean, 100 million. I mean, Drake, who's one of the most popular recording artists of all time, makes his money using his mouth, and I think he's worth over a billion now, right? And then you have um, your mind is the highest level of value, right? And this is someone that's a visionary, and a visionary has the ability to spot trends 
uh, and time things, right? Timing is everything of, for the visionary, right? They, they're able to see where things are going before they get there and be a differentiator in a market before it arrives, right? Which applies a little bit to what we're going to talk about today here and like your intellectual property and what creates value to a buyer, right? So in, in visionaries, you know, the sky is the limit, right? Sky is the limit. Right, so when you build something, if you're building with the end in mind, you wanna build something unique, right? And there's certainly some things I would do differently now that I didn't do then, um, but there were some things I did do well in differentiating my concepts to make it more valuable for someone else, right? Okay, now, number two, um, I knew what I was gonna do before I even started it, right? So I knew what a buy, I, I, I read a lot and thought long and hard about what I knew a buy, or what a buyer would find valuable. Because at the end of the day, like you might be thinking, I need to make whatever, my bills are 3K a month, so I wanna make six. So I need to get enough members to get six. And then you get to six and you stay there because it covers your bills and it's comfortable, right? And then you think you're doing a good job because you have a profitable business. But in reality, that's actually a bad thing for selling a business because people don't wanna buy businesses that are stagnant. People wanna buy businesses that they know they can accelerate and the growth of and add value to. They wanna know that if they are uh, have marketing skills and they buy your business and they apply the marketing skills because you haven't been, that they can accelerate the business up. So they look at the trend of the business and if they realize that like the trend of the business is flat, they're going to assume that there's not a lot of upside there, that you found the upside already and there's no upside beyond beyond that. So you have to know what a buyer finds valuable, which we're going to talk about here, right? I also wanted to build productized services. Productized services, what that is, is like instead of selling someone anything and, and everything and anything that they want, it's for building your services in a way to where they're scalable and they're systemized to where like you can provide an end result without thinking so hard about how you get there, right? So the way that you provide your workout programming, the way that you provide your coaching, the way that you offer it to your members, the way that your members access it, all that stuff being productized. So it's in a nice, nice clean box that the customer understands and that they, um, they understand how to use as well. The fulfillment process is very, very uh, dialed in. Um, one of my favorite books about pretty much all of this, uh, in addition to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is more like mindset and way to think about life. Uh, but in regards to business, is Built to Sell by John Warlow. Um, this book is fantastic. I read this book 2012 while I owned my first gym. And it's what made me like want to change everything, right? Um, it's probably responsible for a lot of why I didn't continue to own some of my previous businesses and why I moved on to build better businesses. In fact, the business I build right now, Big Little Gyms, is a business that's built to sell. I have no plans to sell it anytime soon, but when I decide it's time to time to exit this business and do something else, I don't want it to be when I'm on my deathbed and I certainly don't want it to be because it failed. I want it to be because it's valuable enough and people love it enough that we build a really, really good business that someone else wants to acquire someday. Right, that would be the ultimate situation, right? For everybody, for our customers, for us, for the you know, whoever wants to own it next, to be able to go and make a profit with it and build it even better, right? So this book is fantastic. It talks about all these concepts as well in more detail, almost like step by step. I think he's got like twelve steps in here to building a business, which we're actually kind of talking about some of them in today's video. All right, so we need to solve like the four call in order to to do this. Like, what is a buyer going to find valuable? Like, we need to solve the four core problems that Jim has. Right, so there's four core problems that Jim has. In fact, almost every business has, not just gyms. And it's one of these four things, if not all of them, if not multiple of them, right? So number one is you don't have enough leads, right? So you don't have enough leads coming in because if you had enough leads, you'd be getting more bookings for people to come into your gym and see you and talk to you. You'd be making more sales, you'd have more members, right? If you have enough leads, you're always gonna stay a step ahead of like churn and people leaving and retention issues, right? Those are all things that you're going to, oh, uh, we'll pop up there from a plugin. Um, Generally, life is good when you have enough leads, when you have enough demand, right? Um, number two is all of your customers come from referrals. This is a very, very common one with gyms. Uh, a lot of gyms, a lot of mom and pop, brick and mortar gyms, most of their business comes from referrals. Now, here's the issue with this is the math, right? Okay, so it's good that you have people coming from, I'm not saying referral traffic is bad. I'm not saying don't do referral traffic. That would be silly. Of course, word of mouth and referral traffic is excellent and we should welcome it because it's the highest converting traffic. If someone refers us their friend, we're probably gonna close them. They're probably gonna pay whatever price we mentioned because they already know. They're probably gonna stay a long time because they're friends here, right? So of course we should welcome them. But you really can't scale referral traffic. Referral traffic is ultimately just gonna come from your members hopefully telling their friends. And if you do a good job like provoking them to, they're going to more often, but you can only do so much to scale that. You can't throw more money at that, right? Um, I mean, you can, you can offer your members like referral incentives, 
But like most of them, most of them aren't going to refer. In my experience with owning a gym, most of them aren't going to refer their friends because you're giving them 50 bucks or a free month or whatever. They're just not going to do it. So like this is a problem. They all of your customers are coming from referrals. You need to have multiple traffic sources, right? The quality of your leads is poor. That's another one, right? So say you are running some ads. You're running. Uh, this is really common for gyms that run paid traffic, run paid ads. Is they got all, they get a lot of leads. But the lead quality is very, very poor, very, very um, unqualified leads, people that don't want to pay the prices that their gym costs, people that just don't even respond when they inquire, um, you know, just poor lead quality. And the number four here, no one knows who you are. And this is also very common with most gyms is, you know, us as gym owners, we're there every day. We see it every day. We see a few members in every day. And we're thinking like everybody must know and just be deciding not to come here when in reality, like they don't even know you exist. It's like a tree falling in, a, in the woods where it's like if a tree doesn't fall if a tree falls in the woods and no one's around to hear it does anybody even know the tree existed that's very often what's going on with your gym is that like in a town even 30 40 50,000 people less than a few thousand people even if you've been in business for 5 years have likely even heard of it right and so whatever degree of success you have had is based on a fraction of a fraction of your entire metropolitan area even knowing who you are imagine what would happen if more people just knew who you were you would scale all those results right and how do we solve these problems here, guys? So let me go over here. We're not going to go too deep into this. This is stuff we talk about in some of our other videos, which you can refer to. But this is our entire funnel here. And this is what we built for our gym that is a big part of what uh, our gyms that work with us here at Big Little Gyms are implementing is, you know, all five stages here of getting, acquiring, and keeping customers, right? So getting traffic and building an audience, lead converting that traffic and audience into leads because... People can be seeing who you are, where you, and this is a big thing we see a lot with gyms that we work with is if you've been in business for a long time, you're likely getting a lot of traffic already because you're posting on social media. Maybe you've run some ads. Um, you're on, you, you rank well on Google because you've been there for a while and so you have all this traffic, but you just don't convert leads, that traffic into leads, right? Some gyms we get don't have any traffic and we have to work on, we have to implement those strategies as well with paid advertising, content, organic search and referral strategies. Um, and then from there, it's lead generation. And converting that lead, those leads into, or that, that traffic into leads. And from there, it's converting those leads because leads aren't customers. Leads are just leads. We need to nurture those leads to qualify them and get more of them nurtured and uh, booked to come into our gym through follow-up campaigns and um, nurture and proper follow-up, right? Once we do that, it's getting them into our gym uh, to close and convert, right? That's the next phase here is close and convert and turn them into a recurring member, right? And then once we have a, re a recurring member, a member that's paid to be here, the next step is to retain, resell, and upsell them, right? And these are all, there's all systems for every single stage of this that are very, and for a gym, honestly, very, very simple. Not, now I didn't say easy, you know, simple. The process is simple, but it's very easy to derail yourself focusing on a lot of shiny objects, right? And each one of these stages, whether it be traffic and audience, lead generation, nurture and follow-up, close and convert, or retain, resell, and upsell all have a system that if you do it right, has a certain rate of success. And if you hit that certain rate of success, you are going to have success in your business. You're also going to build, if you have this, and you show this to someone looking to buy your gym, they're gonna be very excited. They're gonna say, oh my gosh, they have numbers and a system for every single process of how we get a customer, how we keep a customer, and how we make them worth more, because that, is the most most important part is uh, people, the the buyer at the end of the day, like that's that's the most value that's the most important thing in business is that we can do those three things of getting more customers, keeping them longer, and making them worth more. There's no magical fourth reason to own a business, right? Uh, outside of like your passion, but again, if it's just about passion and you're not worried about selling a business, then you know why are you here watching this video, right? It wouldn't make sense. Um, if you're building a business to be sellable and acquirable, then we have to think about those three things, getting more customers, keeping them longer and making them worth more, right? So here's what the valuables, here's what the buyer is going to find valuable just to kind of write the, just to kind of chart these things out. So number one, they're going to look for turnkey systems in place, right? If you want a really, really good buyer, a buyer that's going to pay you a premium, if they can buy a turnkey business, it almost feels like a franchise. And the thing is, if they wanted a franchise, they would just go buy a franchise, right? But if they're buying your independent brick and mortar gym, it's because they want to be able to make their own decisions, right? The problem with a franchise is they're very expensive just to get, just to buy the license for the franchise. Then that doesn't include the real estate they got to go and lease. And they have a strict set of rules. Whereas like they might be interested in your business because um, they're looking for an independent model where they can grow that model, right? And make 
decisions out with while having their freedom, right? Which is what I serve. I, I serve independent gyms. I work with some franchi smaller franchises as well um, that are owner operated franchises, but generally most people want to keep that independent independence. You know, they have by not being franchise. So they want, but they want, but they're looking for something similar to a franchise and that they want it turnkey, right? They want something that if they buy your business that next week, there's already things in place for customer acquisition, which is c consistent lead gen and good sales. They know that like this business isn't going to stop generating leads because the old owner is gone. And if you're, this business is attached to you personally on the marketing side and people are just buying you, then you have a big problem and that's going to reduce the value of the company because no one wants to buy a business that when you leave, it goes downhill. Now they got to figure out, they got to figure out how to be you when all these people are attached to you, right? So customer acquisition, and that applies, I'd say, also to uh, your existing customers, not just acquiring new ones, right? Uh, number three here, they're gonna look for a team in place, right? And it's not relying on them having to run it. Most people who want to buy a business are doing it because they don't wanna start one, right? And by starting one, what would they have to do? They would have to coach all the classes, do all the sales themselves, do all the follow-up themselves. There'd be no systems in place, there'd be no personnel in place, there'd be, they, they don't wanna mop the floor. They wanna buy a business where this stuff is already up and going. That's what they're paying the premium for, if it's done right. And last year, they want it profitable, they want it to cash flow, and they want to recoup their investment in a three to five year period. That's usually the math for most people buying a business. I know because I've looked into acquiring businesses, I'm actually in the process of acquiring a stake in a company right now. And the strategy is usually make your investment and hope to make enough cash flow in that next three to five year period to recoup your investment. And now you have an asset that's pretty much paid off and now you're cash flowing with it. Now it makes you money, right? Um, so that's really, really important, right? And under customer acquisition here, like I said, that the three main goals here are to get more customers, keep them longer and make them worth more. So you need to have systems for all these things in place, which is what this is up here. If we were to just zoom out in, on it a little bit, this entire process and flow of how we get customers, right? All right, so going down into the next steps here, guys. So productized services, just going back up here to the top, you know, and building it up, productizing your services. Uh, this is the order of how we revolved, involved us at our gym, right? Like this is how it went down for our gym. So when we first started, we established our core product. Now your business needs to have a core product because like you should be able to say in like a one, one word sense, like this is what we do. Now there might be other things that you do, but you're, at the core of it is this, and it is where most of the revenue resides, right? And it's the 20% that produces, it's the 20% of what you offer that produces 80% of the revenue. And that's true here. You see, we offered five things, and the one thing that produced 80% of the revenue was our core product, which is general group classes, right? Large group classes. We had classes of up to 25, 30 members. Um, when we were smaller, we started with like classes like 10 to 15 just to keep it manageable. And then eventually we grew big enough to where we could have multiple, cl uh, um, we could have multiple classes running at once. Uh, in fact, we even had at one point three different programs running at once in our gym and three different parts of our gym uh, because we had uh, basically acquired all the space connected to our gym and we had a big 10,000 square foot space in multiple rooms. And we had as many as hundred people at once working out in an hour in three different programs. We would have our, uh, our uh, basically strength program, our CrossFit program and our boot camp program all running at the same time with you know up to 30 people in each one. And all of our customers loved it. A Monday afternoon was like the cool, it was like the coolest vibe in our gym with it just you know walking in there and everybody getting after it. So uh, that was our core product was this. We knew that this was the most scalable we knew that we could have one coach coach up to 15 to 20 people and provide a good service. And the resulting dollar per hour that we got out of for every hour of the of uh, coaching that we paid for was like a 20, 30, 40 X multiplier, um, you know, in our gym. So that was a lot of leverage, right? Like we're paying a coach 30 bucks an hour. If everybody there collectively is paying $300 an hour, then we're making, you know, 15 times our money back, right? So that, that was our goal was to, Make sure everybody falls falls back into this, uh, but we needed other revenue streams to get to get people in the door because people wanted to solve other problems, right? So um, we started to offer challenges. We had problems here with the challenge model. Um, it was very successful and made a lot of money, um, but the main issue here being that it was heavily predicated on a paid ad strategy, and the challenge kind of offers kind of got overly saturated in a lot of markets at the time. Um, and I'd say even today, they still kind of are. It's chilled a little bit and I, and challenges still can have a lot of success. We have a lot of success with our gym owners who run our playbooks for our challenges. Um, but it's, you know, 
it, it this year definitely requires you to kind of almost retool your offering. You can't sell challenges and just shove them into the same way of operating that you coach all your other clients. You have to uh, build all the other pieces here. You have to have your nutrition, uh, the fitness, and the accountability pieces all built out. Otherwise, you churn through people. The challenge offer is great for generating front end revenue, but it can have, for us, we were very successful with it because we figured this out. We figured out the nutrition, fitness, accountability stack, which is what we show our gyms that work with us here, Big Little Gyms, how to do. Um, but up until that point, we struggled with it, just trying to give them the same thing everybody else got in the, in the group classes and just calling it a challenge and saying, do it for six weeks. Because the people that sign up for a challenge inherently are coming in for like a get fit quick kind of option. They're not yet committed to the long term. These are people that are trying to get in shape for like an upcoming event, or they're just like, if the ads are well written, they're going to bite on them because they're like, oh, I can lose 20 pounds in six weeks. That sounds great. And then they do it and they stop showing up because like they're not focused on the long term, right? So you need to be able to break beliefs if you're going to run the challenge type of model as a front end offer. But we ran it and had success with it, and we had to overcome a lot of those problems. Um, we then moved to, we added in a new client on-ramp experience, we changed the way we brought new members in. Uh, this helped solve some of the challenge issues and also some of our large group class issues as we got bigger. We needed to change the front end experience because we noticed that as we got bigger and above, further and further above 150 members, our churn rate started to go up. And it wasn't from existing members that have been with us a long time, it was newer members who didn't make it past the 90 day mark. So we realized we needed to retool our front end on-ramp experience to give the, mem give the members more of a, uh, personal touch because we couldn't just throw them into classes anymore because there were 20, 30 people in classes. So we needed to divide that group into a smaller experience that was more of a small group experience where they could step up their skills and feel ready and feel confident and have that sense of completion going into our larger group. And when we did that, it fixed the long-term retention, right? It fixed the long-term retention of those clients. Um, off the back of that, we noticed a lot of people wanted to continue with small group. Um, so rather than move to a one-on-one -on -one private training option, we sold small group for almost the same price and would fulfill on up to five or six people in a small group training sessions with a single coach. And this was a very high leverage model that um, we were paying a coach, you know, 25 to $30 per hour per member. So if they had five members in a group, small group class, that coach would be making between $125 and $150 for that hour. Um, but those members were paying $500, $600 a month. So we were actually getting a really, really high return on that dollar per hour. And that coach was also able to make like 70, 80, hundred K a year coaching that small group. So it's also a very scalable system and a very high leverage system for training. And then we offered, uh, eventually offered some one-on-one -on -one training. We didn't want to build our business around this because, um, it's very sales intensive. While the revenue is great, um, it's not very scalable. So sure, you can make a lot of money, but I didn't want a gym that was full of like 30 personal trainers in order to make the money we wanted to make because each personal trainer could only really handle about 10 to 12 personal training clients per month. So, and that's great for those trainers and we had some of those, but in order to keep getting more customers in a personal training, we needed to get more trainers and then it becomes a personnel issue and a talent issue of trying to find enough good talent that can retain that many personal training clients. So we just added this towards the end for the people that wanted it, but it wasn't what we necessarily uh, pushed for. And all of these were kind of like front end or upsell or resell offers that our clients would take, um, but they would ultimately cycle back into the general group classes. All of these, the goal was ultimately when they did some personal tr private training and they were done with that, rather than leave us, they would go into group classes. If they did some small group with us and want to downgrade, they would go into group classes. If they did the new client on rep experience, obviously that was to go into group classes and challenges were more of like a front end or like resell offer for our existing members that we would do once every quarter and they would go right back into group classes after. And it was the goal was just to keep stoking this and these were to keep it exciting for our members because if they do this forever, uh, A, you're leaving money on the table because people will pay for this stuff. And B, they get bored and go elsewhere and look for these things because you don't offer it, right? So, and these were an evolution. We didn't just one day say we're going to add all four of these things. We added these things step by step, right? And it really was about long-term group class membership, which was the most scalable option because that's where we could staff the least amount of people and serve the most people, right? Okay. So multiple ways to acquire new customers. Um, and this is uh, all funneling into one place that was optimized to convert lead, convert into leads. That is a, it was a big thing is we needed to show, and we knew it was gonna be important to a buyer that they knew that if they went out and did marketing, that they were gonna be able to convert that traffic into leads, right? Because when you're doing marketing and advertising, what you're doing is you're building an audience, right? Now, and that's exclusive of the lead generation that you actually get from it, right? You can build a big audience and have a ton of traffic watching your stuff, but if that traffic never converts into leads that you can you know, convert, into members, 
then it doesn't make sense. So we need to do, do uh, what we call conversion rate optimization, uh, which meant to send all of our traffic to a place where we knew that they could convert. And so what we did is we, we built our website to be fully, convert, fully optimized for lead generation versus like a lot of other things people use a website for, right? And this was in addition to the systems we had attached to the website. Now, this is something that we actually, this is one of the big things we actually do here at Big Little Gyms is provide exactly this, conversion rate optimized. It's not the only thing we do, it's a part of the entire system, right? It's this entire uh, thing here is what we are implementing here. And it's the big pivot point, because if you look here at the top here, all of your paid advertising, is either gonna go through lead forms or your website. All of your content is gonna click through to your website. All of your organic search goes through to your website and all of your referral traffic either is gonna call you or come in with a friend or go through your website. Um, this is something we've studied a lot of data on over the last um, five years of doing this with gyms, with over a thousand gyms and 90% of the traffic they get from their audiences, all these different audiences, whether it be paid advertising, word of mouth or referral, organic search, social media or content finds its way to their website and that's often where they where they will uh, lose them. And it's interesting is a lot of these websites that gym owners will build are sites that they think they've done a good job on and they just built something that they think looks pretty, they don't understand um, what con how, to convert how to optimize for conversion rate. So anyways, we realized that this is really important to us is to make sure we could show a new owner that we could get customers and convert traffic into lead gen. Now those traffic sources, you wanna have multiple traffic sources, they are these, right? So you need to be doing paid advertising, some type of paid advertising. You need to have your referral and word of mouth strategies, which most of that just happens on its own organically. Organic search, which is people finding you through local search. It was very important to us that we were top ranked. And the reason why is uh, most people, the best quality leads aren't gonna find you on paid advertising. In fact, that's where your least qualified leads are, are the ones you get from paid ads. When you run Facebook ads, eight out of 10 leads you're gonna get are going to be junk. You could still make a lot of money running them. It's just a numbers game, but you're going to talk to a lot of leads that don't convert. And it's a definitely a strategy you have to use, but organic, if you build it good enough, you can build a very, very good business that um, grows without having to do a lot of paid advertising with organic. Uh, and if you have a, if you're ranked well and you have a very, very, if you have, if you have a very good authority, very, very good reputation and very, very relevant content, you're going to generate a lot of leads, right? Uh, social media is very, very important. You need to be doing a social media sta strategy. And the social media is, if you think about it, is really just the hook. It's the thing that just kind of like gets people's attention, lets them know you exist. And it's a great way to have people see you a lot of times, but it's not necessarily like going to directly generate leads in the short term. Social media is more of a snowball. The more, the bigger you build the snowball, the more surface area it gets and the more uh, conversions it starts to spin off, right? And the same with content, whether it be like your newsletter, your blog, some of your social media content, whatever else you're putting out there, all this stuff is gonna funnel into your lead generation funnel, okay? It's very, very important you have this dialed in. This is probably one of the most important systems for uh, a business that's being built to sell or just a business that's gonna be successful. It's because you can go and do all this stuff and if this is not done well, then you're not gonna see the upsides of all this, right? Okay, so how do we make it sellable, right? So A, not every gym can sell, right? In order for your gym to sell, like, you have to have an, probably have an assumable lease in the space you're in, or at least um, the landlord will allow the lease to be assumed, or you can have the newly signed. If you're in kind of a creative space, I've seen some gyms where they're like in the basement of some guy's church. And it's like, mm, I don't know if, you know, like is someone going to find that valuable that like, because there's no way that you can guarantee the next owner that you're going to have a, you know, 30 cent lease, 30 cent per month per square foot lease. There's just no way you can guarantee that, right? Um, a lot of the real estate issues that present themselves are a part of it, right? Like you need to make sure that the space it's in can go with it and that the current rate that it's being leased at is going to be able to be passed on or at least close to the next, the next owner of the company, right? Um, even, even better is if you own the real estate. So if you're the gym owner and you currently own the building it's in, you can still sell your gym and lease back that space to that new owner. In fact, that's the best strategy for any gym owner long-term. Because you're probably not going to own your gym forever. If you can acquire the property it's in, you can eventually sell that gym to someone maybe earlier in the journey. You continue to own the building and then lease them to it at a competitive rate to the market. And now you have a built-in tenant from the, and the business goes on. And you continue to be a part of it even. But you're the owner of the building, not the owner of the gym. Right? So you got to think about like, can my gym even sell? Are there, re are there real estate limitations? Um, is the lease I have like assumable? Is the, you know, if I leave and I, and I, and I, um, you know, this lease ends, 
is the lease rate the owner the new owner is going to get is that going to pass on because if they're a good buyer and they're going to pay a premium they're going to look at these things right a bad buyer who's not going to pay you very much probably isn't going to think about that and then just find out later that his lease is going up double that's happened to a lot of gym owners a lot of new gym owners are like oh my lease just doubled because the previous owner didn't tell me that they had a special rate with the landlord that ended when their lease was up and it's like well yeah that's going to happen right so you need to think about those things right um, it needs to have value Right, so we already talked a lot about what's valuable. We're gonna go a little deeper into what's valuable, what the specific things that a gym that a, that a buyer is gonna find valuable. Uh, you need to find the right kind of buyer, which we're gonna talk about in the next steps as well. Um, and it cannot rely or be too attached to the founder. So that's very, very important. If it's just too reliant on you or is gonna be too reliant on the new buyer, they're probably not gonna be interested unless they just want a job, which is gonna be the person who doesn't have the money, right? Someone who is buying this gym because they wanna make their paycheck owning your gym probably doesn't have like a million dollars to pay you for your gym. They're going to need to either go get funding, which they're probably not going to qualify for because they don't have the income, or they're going to just be looking for like a cheap deal where they like, hopefully I can buy this gym for the, some part of the equipment, which is not the kind of buyer we want. But if you want that kind of buyer, then go for it. But personally, myself, when I built my gyms, I wanted someone who wanted to pay a premium for my gym because of the systems I built and that it was going to make them a lot of money, right? Now here's what creates value. Very, very important. Okay, so intellectual property and concept is probably one of the most valuable things, right? So if you're just a cookie cutter CrossFit gym, you have no intellectual property, right? I see a lot of gym owners in their social media. I'm friends with about 4,000 gym owners on Facebook and on, and on Instagram. And I see their posts and a lot of them, they just tout CrossFit, for example, or like whatever other methodology they're following, Zumba, whatever, right? Like whatever the thing is, like, like you're promoting someone else's stuff, right? And sure, maybe you love CrossFit and you love the methodology and the community and all that stuff, but those things aren't unique to that concept. They just, they just popularized it, right? At the end of the day, like, you know, does a CrossFit gym have value because of the brand name on it? Sure. If someone else really wants a CrossFit branded gym, but using CrossFit as an example, it's not as popular as it was eight years ago. In fact, it is, according to Google Trends, 75% less popular than it was. So there's not going to be like this big rush to the market of people, you know, that like think CrossFit's the newest, greatest thing since sliced bread anytime soon, probably not ever again, because fitness trends are very fad like in that they come and go. Right. And so, and again, I'm not saying that if you have a CrossFit gym, you don't have value, but you're going to get more value if you have a unique concept, right? If you have a unique concept, that's your own branded thing and not ABC athletics, but it is a conceptual way of looking at fitness. It is a methodology in itself. And sure, it can maybe be a derivative of another methodology, but you don't want to be giving that other methodology the credit for it, right? Like, because you have derived it yourself, right? Now, you don't have to do that, but if you want more value, you will, because if someone um, who, say, is an institution, institutional investor, someone that's looking for a concept that they can franchise, and if your concept is unique and different, they will pay multiples more for it because they're not buying the gym anymore. They're buying the concept. Intellectual and pro property and concept are, are, the, are the most valuable things in any business model. How you're different is what makes you valuable. It also is what makes people draw to your business as customers, right? So intellectual property and concept will get you a higher multiple. Uh, if you're just reselling CrossFit, TRX training, any of these other brand name concepts, you can still have valuable value through some of the other things here that we find valuable, but you're giving up this, which is another way that you can increase multiples, right? If you do all four of these things, you're gonna have the ultimate multiple on your valuation. Valuation is a fancy way of saying what it's worth, what the offer should be. The more of these you leave out, the more you leave on the table, right? Uh, what creates value? Uh, growth trending upward, right? So you have to have your growth trending upward. If you're flat, when someone comes to look, they're not gonna be that excited about it. I don't wanna buy a business that's sitting flat. People, most people wanna buy a stock when it's trending up, right? That's when most people wanna buy a stock. Stocks, when they're trending down, only tend to get worth less, right? It's not exciting to buy something that's on a downward trend because you're trying to fight against market forces in that situation, right? That's what it looks like. That's what it feels like, right? So you need to have growth trending upward, right? You need to be acquiring more customers than you're losing each month. And if they were to look at a line graph of your growth, growth, it needs to be going like this upwards. If it's not and it's flat or it's going downward, then uh, you're not going to get as high a multiple. You're not going to get any multiple probably, right? 
Okay, a committed and aligned team. Team is one of the most valuable things to all businesses when it comes to acquisitions. If you have a really good team, if you have a killer operator that's like in love with your brand and your concept, understands it as good as you do, runs it every day, is ride or die for this business, isn't going anywhere, sees their life's work of running your gym, and he's gonna stay with the business when the next guy takes it, in, takes it on, and he's got three or four disciples under him that you've helped assemble, that is so valuable. That is so valuable. The team is one of the most valuable parts. If, if a buyer comes in and sees that you have like a very unorganized team, they're not aligned, they don't really understand the mission that well, it's you trying to convince them with it all the time, you're always at ends with each other, they're part-timers who aren't that committed, this is just the phase of life, they're gonna do it while they're in college, but then they're gonna get out of college and go do their own thing, you're gonna get less of a multiple, if any multiple at all, right? So you need a committed and aligned team of full-time people, right? Uh, higher average client value. Right, so this creates a lot of value as well, right? If they can look and see that for every customer you get, and this is like when people buy companies, this is one of the number one metrics they look at is average client value. So there's actually a, a formula. It's called, it's called the CAC to LTV ratio. And what this means, if I were to use an example of say, now CAC stands for cost, customer, acquisition cost, right? And LTV stands for uh, lifetime value, okay? And this is how bigger business investors think about making money with customers and acquiring customers. Most small business owners don't think about this way. Most small business owners, most gym owners think about it like this. Of, if it costs me $100, if it costs me $200, if, it's, if I'm getting $200 a month from the customer and it costs me $200 to get them, then it's not a good deal because I'm breaking even on the first month. Or if say they even have to lose money to get a customer, they won't do it. Say it costs you $300 a month to get customers through paid advertising, which would be considered expensive, and you lose money in the first month because you only get $200 from them, you lose $100, most gym owners won't do it. And this is actually very short-sighted thinking because that's not how actual business people grow businesses. How they look at it is not the one month value of a customer, they look at it as lifetime value of a customer. And the formula looks like this. If say my average gym member stays for easy math, 20 months, and they're worth $200 a month, that is $4,000 in, let's just do it this, okay, so $200 a month, $200 a month times 20 months equals $4,000 in lifetime value, okay? Now say it's really expensive for me to get customers with paid advertising. Say I'm already getting customers with organic, say I'm already getting customers with referral, but I'm not getting enough to keep growing. Because eventually what will happen is that the gym gets big enough and you only have organic and word of mouth, like you will be at like a net even, net zero churn because you're losing, say you're getting 10 members a month organically and you're losing 10, and you're gaining 10 members a month. Say so you're gaining 10 members a month organically and you're losing 10 members a month from churn, then you're breaking even, right, each month on the, on the new customer acquisition. You're not growing, which is... If they're an institutional investor, they're going to think about how they can keep growing it. And how you can keep growing it is you can pay money to acquire customers. So say it's expensive in your area to acquire customers using paid advertising. Say it's very competitive and you have to spend $500 to get a new customer using paid advertising. Um, let's see, per, uh, let's see, it's customer acquisition cost. Customer ac cost, which is CAC, okay? So the, the CI, the, the, the LTV, it's actually flipping this around. So it's the LTV to, cal to CAC ratio, it goes this way. So you just do the math, it's simple. You do this number here, the, the 4,000 divided by the 500. And what does that equal? That equals 20, right? So that means they're doing 20 to one for every dollar they spend, right? Because 4,000 divided by 500 is 20. So that means for every $1 they spend, they're getting $20 back. And that is a great LTV to, to CAC ratio. Um, and so that's really important to know your average client value and your customer acquisition cost. Okay, these two things, okay? All right, so creating systems, moving on. Um, you need, you need systematic ways to get members, right? You need an entire system like this here that we showed you earlier. You need to have your traffic and audience, your lead generation, your nurture and follow up, your close and convert, and your retain, resell, and upsell all systemized to where they're repeatable and reliable throughout the seasons. 
because no one wants to buy a business where they feel like they got to build all that stuff. Otherwise, they would just go start one themselves or they're not going to pay a premium for yours. Right? They might pay you a little bit of a premium because you, you get your customer list and your equipment, but they're not going to pay a premium above and beyond that because you're not giving them anything. Right? You cannot be reliant on the owner and you need operational processes and really, really important processes for talent acquisition and training. A lot of people don't think about their business the way they market it in regards to how um, it looks to potential hires. Right? My gym was in an area and we also did a good job of building the brand to where in the area, a lot of trainers wanted to work for us. So we had a lot of coaches that came in wanting to coach our class programs, our small group programs, our personal training programs. We had some coaches that came in that wanted to build their own programs uh, and have us make the revenue, but they just wanted to run it and be paid as employees. Um, because our gym just had this buzz about it as it was the place to be employed and it looked good on a resume, right? So you need to have talent acquisition and you need to, you need to have great training. So we had entire, internship processes. We actually give all those internship processes to the gyms that work with us here in Big Little Gyms now because they worked so well for like identifying talent, recruiting talent, and training and developing talent. Because your talent and your team, like I said up here, is one of the most valuable parts. And by doing this, we would develop really, really aligned team members that were so grateful for us because we we gave them value. It wasn't, hey, come coach a class, here's 20 bucks an hour. We had them do an entire internship processes that were 60 days long, that where they were paid and they got a lot of shadowing, they got a lot of training, they got a lot of coaching about like not just how to coach classes, but how to be more organized individuals, how to live a better life and um, lead by example, right? How to uh, lead class environments in better ways so they're more efficient. Things that they found really, really valuable, right? Okay. So here's what you're going to need when, you, when it comes time to sell. These are the people you're going to need on your team right here. You're going to need three key players. Uh, you're going to need a broker for sure. Um, you don't have to broker it if you're not trying to get a premium, if you're just trying to sell it for like the, some of the parts, you, you can, you don't, you probably don't need a broker. Brokers are going to take a percentage. It's usually like five to 10% of the sales price they're going to take depending on the broker. You're going to want to find a broker. That's, uh, someone that's proven and trustworthy because there is some weird things out there in the broker world where like, they might give up commission with you and give away, you know, negotiate you giving away your business and then make money on the backside of that, which is te technically illegal, but I've heard of it happening. So you're going to want to find a business broker that is proven and trustworthy, right? You could try to broker the deal yourself, but the thing is a professional broker, if they're, if they're working in your best interest and in their best interest in making a true upfront commission on your sale, they're not going to get paid unless they sell your business. And they also, their paycheck is based on how much you sell your business for. So it's a, it's a performance-based commission they're going to get you more money, right? They're going to ask more money for business that you probably would. And you're going to, you know, in places where you're not confident, they're going to be confident and they're going to sell the business for you. This also implies competition. So when they go and shop it and they get a bunch of offers, they can get the offers competing and you get better offers. You get more money out of it, right? You're going to definitely want a lawyer. Um, in the acquisitions and sales I've done, I've had a lawyer every time. It's expensive, yes. Uh, most lawyers fees are going to be expensive. You could find a lawyer that maybe works off a commission of the sale of the business as well. Uh, but most lawyers won't do that. They want to be paid up front because a lot of lawyers get burnt by these types of deals where it's a handshake deal where if I'll pay you later once the business sells and it's for a percentage of the business and then the business never sells and they never get it. And lawyers, chief thing that they're selling is their time. So they ask big premiums. The lawyer, I recently had overlook a uh, operating agreement and uh, was $3,000 just for an hour. Um, now you can find lawyers cheaper than that. I feel like with lawyers, generally you get what you pay for. If you go to like some sort of like shop where they're going for volume, they're going to probably use using a lot of AI stuff and not even looking at it themselves. And it's going to leave you open to scrutinization and issues, right? So I'd say get a good lawyer, pay them well. Um, it's a sunk cost of selling your business, right? So you might have to come out of pocket to have a lawyer, you know, go over your operating agreements. If you have an LLC or your stock purchase agreements, if you have a, 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 a corporation, um, and make sure that, you know, your, uh, purchase agreements are all dialed in because that will cost you more money. Uh, if that stuff goes foul and someone takes advantage of you. Okay. Third, you need a personal third party, right? You need a system. You need a mentor who's going to help you implement is going to give you and help you implement systems and also knows the path to the sale, right? Like what building a sell looks like and what others are going to find valuable, but also they're going to guide you objectively and keep you focused along the way. Um, I've helped uh, mentor and facilitate and guide multiple business sales for gyms. Um, and it's one of my favorite things that I've done. And along the way, my, my job was to, you know, make sure they were taken care of and make sure they were thinking 
clearly and not getting distracted because a lot of times the gym owner would have like emotional experiences during it um, and get distracted by that and have doubts. And the thing is like, if you start leading people on and not following through, you're going to get a reputation for that. No one's going to want to make an offer on your business. Um, also like helping you get the system in place and fine tune the system, get your numbers in order. So when you sit down and show this to somebody, they're like, holy cow, this is a well-built business, right? A well-built business is the one that's going to sell for the most. I personally, uh, like I mentioned earlier on the video here, have, um, you know, over spent almost a million dollars on mentorship and guidance and all in the honor of building my businesses along the way. So they can be maximally profitable and cash flow, but also be sellable, right? I have guidance and mentorships right now that I'm a part of that have to do with me building the next phases of my business. And every phase of the business requires new overhauls and new, new, new mentors and guide, guides sometimes, right? Okay. Now starting the process, how do you start this process? Well, reasons to sell, right? You got to look for your reasons to sell. Um, you know, for me, I had goals. I, when I started the business, I said, when we get to a certain number, that's when we're going to entertain a sale. And for us, it was getting to a million dollars annual run rate with the business. When we crossed 83, $83,334 per month at our gym, that's when we knew it was time to take a look, right? A, because we knew the business uh, will have made us a lot of cash flow up to that point. Uh, we also knew that being able to sell a million dollar gym uh, and making a million dollar gym with that kind of profit, because we had like 40% profit margins after everybody was paid well, um, and we made multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars running that gym, we knew that that would be a business that would be very, very attractive to sell. So that's the best reason to sell. Now you have other reasons you might want to sell. It could be because you're relocating. Generally, you want to sell proactively, not reactively to something else. If you're selling because you're tired of doing this and you don't want to see it through, bad reason to sell because someone's going to, whoever goes to buy this thing is going to shoot holes through your business and you're going to, they're going to work you down because they're going to realize that you want out of it. Right. Uh, me, when I went to sell my gym, I didn't want out of it. It was actually a great business. Would have loved to continue to own it, but we had our goals and we stuck to it. And that was our reason to sell. When we got there, we made those moves and we moved and we made the, the deal and we moved on. Right. Um, Making the decision, very, very important to commit to the process once you begin it, because if you start working with bro brokers and lawyers and mentors and guides and not showing up and following through on the, on the things you're saying you're going to do, you're going to frustrate all those people. And those are all very, very important people that you need to have in your corner. Those are the people that you don't want to make mad, right? If you say to a mentor or a guide, you're going to do something to build your business and you don't do it, and you say that the program didn't work, which we've had before, then you're going to frustrate those people and gain a reputation for doing that. You're also setting a standard for yourself. I mean, at the end of the day, like what you watch yourself do is the biggest thing, right? Like if you try to exit a business and your reasons, reasoning for selling something and trying to maximize its value because you just don't want to do it anymore. And you haven't taken that gym to the motherland, then you're just going to do that again with the next business, right? For me, it was very important. I saw every business through for myself and built a really, really good business that took care of my people, that took care of my clients, that took care of my staff, that took care of me and, and earned me back all of those years I spent building that business outside of just the cash flow I, I made from it. You know, I, I didn't want to go into my next business looking back on the previous businesses, businesses that I started as early exits that were uh, not worth the time spent building them, right? Okay. Making sure you have your numbers readable. This is super important, guys. Um, your numbers should be readable enough for a fifth grader to see that this makes sense. Okay. Like your fifth grader should be able to use their basic, basic algebra and be like, yep, it costs, looks like if I spend $500 to get a client, they're worth 10. This is a good business, right? You should know your client acquisition numbers, right? Um, you should know what it costs to serve as a customer, right? And that can be a complicated number to figure out, but if you can break it down to, Hey, over the lifetime of a customer, this is what it costs for us to do business with that, this number of customers at that length of time, right? You should have true profit and loss, right? True profit and loss. So a P&L statement is very, very important and it needs to be very well detailed in your different expense categories. Um, and also it should be true. Like, and obviously when we run a business, there's things that are, you know, business related things that we write off against our business that are more for us personally. You need to make sure you have a true profit loss to make sure that the person buying the business you know, isn't accounting for that because when you are no longer a part of the business, those things aren't going to go up against the business's cost. The new owner is going to choose to put their own things up against the business's cost that they deem as like viable business expenses. You need to make sure you have a true prof profit and loss of what it takes to run this company independently of who's running it. Okay. All right. The numbers that matter the most in a, in a sale are going to be the multiple. So what does the offer and what do you, what should you expect here? A lot of people ask me like, what should the gym sell for? 
Okay. Now, in all the deals that I've been a part of and all the ones that have gone the best and have made the, um, the, the exiting party the happiest um, and, made, and uh, were good, good offers, at best, usually you're going to see for um, like your typical gym, if it has everything, everything we talked about here, um, you're going to look at probably like 1x revenue, right? 1x annual revenue is probably going to be what you could expect to sell it for right? For like a typical gym concept where you don't have any specific IP, say you're just reselling a CrossFit gym and it has 200 members, it has great lead generation systems, it has great customer acquisition systems, it has great operational systems, it has great um, everything. Everything's just turnkey ready to go. If that gym does say $600,000 per year, a safe bet, safe ballpark is going to be somewhere around $600 is what you're going to sell that gym for to exit it right? And that's great because maybe you only spent 50 or 60K to buy all the equipment and now you're going to get 600,000 for it because you built a business instead of just owning some equipment or owning a job, right? And that's a ballpark. There's a, there's, if you look out, like uh, if you were to go in like Google search or like YouTube search, like business evaluations, it gets really complicated really quick. And then there's even guys in the gym world that have all these complicated metrics for trying to figure out evaluation. What's funny about all of them though, is that they almost all result in one times annual revenue for a good turnkey gym that's profitable, right? And when I say profitable, I mean like 30% plus profit margin. Um, like I said, full team, client acquisition systems all dialed in, client retention systems all dialed in. Doesn't require the owner to show up every day, right? One times revenue. If it's missing pieces of that, you're, you're, you're gonna, it's gonna come down considerably. It's gonna come down considerably. If you have to show up, if, you, if you're coaching all the classes, like that's gonna be a big knock. It's probably gonna cut it in half. So that $600,000 gym might be worth like 300,000. Um, if you have no consistent lead gen systems, it's probably gonna cut it in half again. And now that $600,000 gym is worth like 150,000. Um, if you don't have any full-time staff, at that point, if you don't have those things, your, your best offer is probably just gonna be what the equipment is worth, plus any upgrades to the space. And maybe a little bit of money for like the customers that you have coming in, the cash flow it's making. But that person is essentially buying a job from you. They're not buying a business, right? They're buying a job. They got to show up and work. And that the money that they have to work to get that revenue has comes at a cost too. People's time comes at a cost. Like I wouldn't buy a business and go work at it for any less than $500 an hour. In fact, a lot more than that probably. Um, based on the money we make now, what my nominal cost per hour is for the businesses I own and generate revenue for now is over $2,000 an hour. So like, if you're selling me a business and I got to go work in it to make the money, then I'm charging against that business a $2,000 per hour cost for my time. Now, this is just figuratively, but if I were to do the math over the course of a year of what that cost is, and I would need a tremendous deal on the business to make it worth my time because I make more money over here with my time, right? Okay. Another thing to pay really close attention to in the buyout of the gym if you do get a really, really good offer is a lot of times they'll try to squeeze, try to do it on an earn out. So cash versus earn out. Cash is really the only thing I would say matters. Um, you, earn outs are often more of a safety net for the buyer. And if they're going to do an earn out, you should ask for more money because there's also a better chance that they don't pay you, right? It's very easy uh, for someone to buy a business and pay you half of what they owe you. Say you agree to sell the gym to them for 600,000. And they say, I'm going to give you $300,000 cash and you're going to earn the next 300000 out over the next two years if you stay on and keep it where it is, you know, keep it profitable. The problem with that is, is you don't own the business anymore, so you don't make decisions on the financial end anymore. So if they decide that you help them make too much money over that couple of years and they're going to owe you that $300,000, they can choose to, at the end of the year, go spend $100,000 on ads and just wash out all the profit. And then they say they don't own you. And if, you sign, and if you signed off on that, there's nothing illegal about it. There is no government regulated, regulatory body that's going to come save you in that situation because it's clear as day that it's just based on profit, uh, right? And so earnouts, earnouts, earnouts most often go well if both parties trust each other. But generally, you can't, you know, if you sell the gym and in a year from now, there's another shutdown because of a big worldwide pandemic, that person's probably not going to pay you because they aren't making any money and their, their livelihood is now at stake, right? So you need to consider the upfront cash you're getting in the deal and just consider earnouts bonus, right? So if you can get 75 or 80% or even 100% of, of it all upfront in cash, 
take it, right? Take that. And if you are going to do an earn out, then that should be negotiated against, right? Remember that like it's no matter how nice the person is, it's still you versus them. And, you know, do they want it to be fair and do they want it to be equitable for both parties? Sure, probably. But like when push comes to shove, people are going to position themselves to have as low as risk as possible. Always, right? And number three here is track record and consistency. The business needs to show clear and consistent growth over a long period of time if you want to maximize your evaluation. If your gym is doing a million dollars a year and it's on trade on pace to do 1.25 next year and 1.5 the year after, and you can show that on paper, then you can ask a bigger multiple than this, right? If you have IP, you know, if you have an intellectual property in a in a in a, in a program that is um, unique and different and and can be scaled out into multiple locations to maybe it could become a franchise concept, you're going to get more of an evaluation. I've seen some gyms go for 3x. I've seen brick and mortar gyms go for $3 million, but those were gyms that had a unique concept and IP, like they owned the IP and the license and had the brand trademarked. They had clear and consistent track record um, and they had everything systemized out and the owners were often not, they were not operators. They had operators at every location, right? All right. Last, uh, last couple things here, guys. So we have who's likely buying the gym and things that will impact exit, right? So who is likely buying the gym? Um, it's usually one of three people and there could be a fourth random type of circumstance, but it's gonna likely fit into one of these three boxes. So number one and most common is like a current or past coach or member. Um, this is probably, this is someone who probably loves the tribe and wants a job. They probably love your tribe and they just wanna see the community go onward. Now this is very, this is nice, it's convenient, but it's often not gonna be the person that's gonna pay the biggest premiums for your gym or like understand making like this kind of deal, right? Like. They're often someone that's just buying it for the sum of the parts, um, might otherwise consider doing it themselves, but they want to buy your gym. Um, a lot of gym owners will leave a lot of money on the table when they do this because like, it's just convenient. It's right there and they never go and shop it or go see a broker or um, put it on the market to see what the gym could otherwise get in value, right? I've seen a lot of gyms do this and then the new owner takes it on and it's like just somebody who wants a job and like they end up like we've had gyms that are part of our program where they literally do a handover and the client takes on, or the new owner takes on all the um, systems. And because the original owner never really put them in the place, the new, <laughs> the new owner is like just, like just as confused like as I am as to like, what are they doing? Um, and that's because they paid like nothing for the business. They left, you know, like they didn't buy the systems, right? They just like bought the, the space and, the, and like just want to coach people, right? That's one type of buyer. Uh, another type of buyer is going to be, and this is like, probably one of your, these other two are probably more your ideal situation, but they take more work, but they will generate you a lot more, a lot higher outcome in the exit um, is going to be like an outsider, right? So an outsider, because it's going to be very rare that you're going to have a coach or a current member that's going to understand the institutional enterprise enterprise value of your of your business and want to pay it, right? Because they're paying, their members are paying $200 a month. And they know you personally. When you go and tell them you want to sell it for a million bucks, they're going to be like, they're going to probably laugh at you because they don't see how, you think you're worth that. Whereas like an outsider or a competitor, if you've done all the things we talked about in this video and you could show them, it's simply dollars and cents. It's simply dollars and cents and they can see the value and they can see why making the investment to pay a premium for your business is going to make it be a good, good, good decision. So an outsider, outsider could be like an investor or portfolio holder or a holdings company. I've not seen a lot of gyms go to private equity companies, but I have seen it happen. Private equity are like people that just buy a collection of businesses um, and then they have a fund uh, of people that they manage the money for that they invest in these businesses and the job is to get a return. So they'll buy businesses that get high returns and then filter that cash back to the, the, the people that have invested in the fund. Um, that's usually who's in private equity. Um, and there's also people that like another outsider who wants to buy an existing gym. Like there's someone that you don't know that's in the area that wants to buy it. They, they, wanna, they wanna own a gym but they don't want to start from scratch. This is actually becoming more common. I'm seeing a lot more of this these days in the last, last I'd say three or four years, more people selling their gym to other locals that are big business people that uh, want to own a gym um, and uh, they don't want to start one from scratch. They want something turnkey and they're willing to pay a premium for a business that's already ready to go that has a good brand and reputation and authority in the area and, good, and, a good, and it's a good, well-built business. Um, those people are also good to look for a competitor is also not a bad place to go. Um, trouble can be here is letting your competitors know that your business is for sale it can sometimes create some friction. Um, if your current community were to hear about that, you know, like you really don't want word getting out until it's the deal's done. 
but I've seen it happen where, you know, you can have NDAs in place where if you would talk to a competitor and you can have them sign an NDA and say, Hey, listen, you're not allowed to talk about this until you own it. And if you never buy it, you're never allowed to talk about this, right? That's where NDAs come in handy. Um, but there are, I have seen a lot more of this lately too, as we see more market co consolidation. So we're very much in like a market consolidation phase as like a lot of the group gym markets have really done most of their growth in the past 10 years. And there's not as many new gyms coming to market. So what you're seeing a lot more of is like the winners in every market starting to buy up market share and own more of the market. So I've seen some, I have plenty of clients who have done that because they've come with us, they've grown their gym. They've realized um, that they have a great system that will grow and grow their gym. So they'll go and start buying up their competitors as their competitors are going out of business. And they'll deploy our systems on those gyms and they'll own like four or five gyms that are pretty much like a carbon copy of like our systems and the, the first gym and all of them will make money, uh, which is great. So that's also, if you're looking to exit, like not a bad strategy is to look for someone looking to do that. Things that will impact exit. So here's the, uh, the big things to look out for here. Again, kind of circling back to attach the new to the ownership and no operations, uh, flat growth rate, uh, not having intellectual property um, can impact your exit. If you're just selling something anybody else can do, I mean, if you own a CrossFit gym and you just run it cookie cutter, like every other CrossFit gym, and it's not a unique concept. Because I own CrossFit gyms, but we also uh, built our branding uh, not around the CrossFit brand. Like we offered CrossFit as one of our methodologies, but it wasn't the um, primary core brand of what we did. Most gyms, they're just selling CrossFit and like everything they post about is CrossFit and how CrossFit's the greatest thing since sliced bread. A, that's annoying. Uh, B, um, you're just building someone else's brand and not talking about your own brand and your own concepts and your own methodology or your own take on it even, right? Um, so that, you know, is really, really important. And then funding. Um, last thing that's really important is to understand that who you're talking to with a buyer, um, they're going to probably need funding. And if they don't, they need to have cash, right? So you don't want to waste your time. You want to make sure you're upfront with people. And like, if someone's going to make an offer on your business, they need to go seek funding first, right? Because most people sitting around that are going to go buy a gym probably don't have the cash. Uh, they're probably going to go need to talk to a banker themselves. And that's where you might want to have connections with the banker as another one of your people appear in your, uh, uh, people that you want to have in your, your cohort here is a banker. Uh, someone that can help with funding in these situations, um, that knows your business, that can help a buyer get funding. Um, they should probably seek their own funding for their own protection because it's kind of a conflict of interest to use the seller's funding. Um, cause obviously the seller might be getting a kickback on that and that's just not, um, I don't know, smart. Um, so that's what I would recommend, um, you know, is making sure the buyer knows the funding, making sure before they even make an offer or waste your time. Like, hey, you must have, it's, that, it's this way with houses now. You can't make an offer on a house unless you have your funding secured. You either have to have the cash and proof of the cash, be able to show a financial statement, or you have a loan and proof that you have that, ca that loan ready to execute when you make this purchase. Um, it was the same with my gyms is either they had to have the cash or like I needed proof. So I made the, when I sold the second gym, I made the guy go and get the loan and bring me like the loan acceptance documents. And when he did that, that's when we got serious about the offer and had conversations. So that's it guys. So as you can see, it all comes down to customer acquisition sy systems and retention systems. Like in order to get to a place where this business has any value on its own, it can't be reliant on you. You know, the, one of my favorite sayings is like your, your business, businesses don't thrive on the level businesses don't thrive on the level of your work ethic. That's what a lot of gym owners think. They think, well, I do coach all the classes. I do all the work and I deserve all the, all the money. And in reality, like we said earlier, being an implementer is the lowest level of value. Your business is always going to fall to the level of your systems. If you don't have any systems, then you're going to fall, fall pretty far, even if you are profitable. Right. Um, and so, you know, pros hire pros guys, you know, as I mentioned up here in one of the previous steps, one of the most important people in your cohort is having that third party mentorship guide, uh, system strategist, uh, in your back pocket that you can rely on and pros hire pros. And this is said by <laughs> every great player ever. Like we have Michael Jordan here, greatest basketball player of all time. No one could outperform Michael Jordan probably still can't these days, but he had coaches because he had people that were looking out for his strategy and how he used that energy and how he best deployed his energy to have maximum results to win championships. Right. And big little gyms, like I want you guys to imagine a system for gym owners that builds this ecosystem and implements the flywheel strategy that we talked about in this video, it shows you how to use it like a boss to surround yourself with winners, with results who are sharing, 
to produce repeatable, consistent results and not not just right now, but for a long time. Like while you own your gym, even if you're not thinking about selling it, if this is just education, you need to build your business sell, not because you're gonna sell it one day, but because like the business that is built to sell is the business that, that is the most valuable to own yourself, right? The one that has the most enterprise value on an open market is also the one that's gonna make you the most money. It's gonna cash flow the best. It's gonna take better care of you and your family. And we want this to feel like hanging out with friends, right? With real business results, you know, Big Little Gems is a tribe. We have 600 plus gym owners in our program right now. We've doubled year over year. And um, this is a cohort of gym owners, almost like a mastermind that um, are in, you know, sharing with each other, guiding each other, mentoring each other. We get on the coaching calls every week and share. We implement the systems. We talk about the systems. And this is how we do it. So pillar one here, your model, your model offer and mindset. If I just scroll in on this a little bit. We're going to set up your lead gen engine, turnkey. Uh, everything from your funnel to landing pages to CRM to uh, SEO to all this stuff, uh, your follow up and for your follow up and set appointment setting machine, all that stuff is going to be set up. All your automations, all your workflows, all your follow up and um, AI driven workflows. Um, you're going to implement the traffic flywheel, organic and paid. We're going to go through your closing and sales processes to make sure we have a proven and repeatable process there. We're going to fine tune operations and fulfillment. And then we're going to scale to the moon, right? And our system is a private community and a virtual classroom with all the turnkey playbooks, with all the systems installed for you in your business, right? And you have three weekly growth tech and strategy calls every week. This is one part done for you, one part systems, and one part guidance and mentorship, right? Very unique, very different. Most programs you're going to sign up for out there are either going to be tech and tools or guidance and mentorship or some advice or like a coaching call, we're actually all three in one place, right? So you're not having to hodgepodge this stuff together, right? Our timeline looks like this. You have six weeks um, with us when you start. Before it goes into ongoing, we onboard you and your team to get our systems in place and in your business. You're gonna build, set up your funnel, SEO, CRM, automations, and tech so it just works. Guide you on deploying our growth and operational strategies. You're gonna start to get more leads, more book more intros and sell more at higher prices in the first month because we're gonna get your sales processes dialed in too. Then each month we're gonna have a plan and strategy for growth provided for you. That's gonna get your place to this place where one day you can consider selling it for a big premium and have a big exit and um, go on to do even bigger things. But you guys must be ready. You must be ready to show up and do the work on your end to practice speed to lead and smile and dial, to show up to the calls, to book your leads, to, show you, to sell your shows, to serve your members better and to make growth a top priority for this next quarter, all right? And um, this is not for you if you're someone if, if, if you think someone's gonna do this all for you, right? Like if you think um, some marketing agency running ads for you is you building a marketing system, you would be wrong, right? Um, if you just wanna continue tinkering, continuing to spin your wheels in the mud, have at it. If you're looking for get rich, fa get rich fast or get rich quick, you know, if you're gonna go out there and like someone's gonna sell you on getting 50 members in 30 days running some TikTok ads and you believe that stuff, then have at it. Uh, we'll be here waiting when you want to actually get some good systems in place and principle-based stuff in place that we know works for a long time. This is also not for you if you don't understand opportunity cost, right? Like you have to invest your time and money into your business to build systems that are going to scale so one day you can exit on your own terms, right? And this is for those who want to build real systems and strategies that will help you get more members, make them worth more, keep them longer, serve your community better, not temporarily, but for a long time. And if that's you, then you're invited to go to biglittlegyms.com. When you get there, you can read a little bit more about what we do. There's a little video on there that I tell specifically, tell you specifically what we get into in our program. Um, and then you can click the get started button when that form pops up, there's name, phone number, email, basic contact info, where we can message you and give you more details. Um, and then it will take you over to book your discovery call with us. And it'll ask you a few questions about your business, your current situation, your desired situation, and what you're trying to hopefully do. And then we'll meet on that call and uh, answer all the questions you have about our program and get you started. Uh, if you want to do that, then go ahead and go to biglittlegyms.com and uh, get it going, guys. Thanks for watching today. If you found this video valuable, please go down below it and click that like button. Click the subscribe button if you want to get um, all of our latest and greatest videos up at the top of your feed. And feel free to throw a little comment in the comment section if you enjoyed this or if you have any follow-up questions that I can follow up with you guys in the next video. Thanks and have a great day, guys. We will talk to you soon. Bye.